when we talk about land and we talk about nations, we always tend to um, associate those things with a geography. There's always a land base, uh, some idea of the land that you occupy or space or a place. Um, in this case, this is a map of Kwakwakiwak territories. This is where I come from. Uh, the Kwakwakiwak are a number of nations that reside on the northwest coast. Um, and it, I, I don't know how clearly you can see it, but there's a village in there near the top um, called Kwai, and uh, that's the community that I come from, as well as Kwai Estums. Uh, so I wanted to show this just as a way of kind of showing the geography from which uh, we come from and how we consider our, um, our land base. Um, and then to show you actually the land itself, because oft times, and even looking at the painting that's off to the right here, when we talk about nationalism and uh, national symbols, then we are often uh, using those things to directly correlate to a specific land base. So I wanted to show that village where I actually come from, and this is Kinkum Inlet. And it's on the mainland part of the coast, kind of maybe uh, across from the top of where Port Hardy is on Vancouver Island. As you can see, it's a really, really tiny place in, within a vast, vast landscape. This is a work that was done in 1921. Uh, it's pictographs at the mouth of the river um, in Kinkum Inlet. This was done at a time, the year 1921 was very significant to the Kwakwakiwak people because that was the kind of culmination of the uh, oppression of our cultural practices. So in 1921, the uh, Kwagyo Indian agent William Halliday was successful in, carcer in, in incarcerating quite a number of our people for potlatching, which was our way of kind of remembering, delineating, and uh, taking, t uh, keeping track of our political kind of social um, standings amongst each other, and also our connections, therefore, to our land bases. In a way, it was our parliament. So it was banned and outlawed, and a number of our people were thrown in jail in 1921, and this was a severe blow to us um, as for our understanding of ourselves as, as Kwakwakiwak people. Um, but significantly, um, my great-grandfather's uh, brothers, they held potlatches that year, and in order to mark that occasion, they had uh, these coppers painted down at the mouth of the river. And a really interesting part of that is those little animals that you see are cows. And there was a farmer who lived um, on the flats below the village. And he was the brother of William Halliday, the Indian agent. And But Reg Halliday actually didn't share his brother's uh, political views completely because he sold those cows to the scows in order for, so that they could, um, uh, I guess, feast with them uh, for the potlatches that they held. I thought that was rather interesting. So to me, this was always a sign of resistance and assertion uh, that despite uh, how we were being oppressed by an outside um, kind of legislated position against our culture, uh, that our own people were <laughs> very tenacious about holding on and continuing to do their what they believed was very important to them. So in 1998, uh, as a modern work, I created this pictograph, and it's not too far away from where the other pictographs are, um, maybe a few hundred meters, but uh, I had wanted to make a very strong declarative statement um, that uh, the lands that we were in uh, were Zawadeno lands, and I wanted to make a very bold statement that uh, in, in uh, our opinion, uh, we were we were there and we were there to stay and that we had an intrinsic history within that landscape that we were going to continue to uphold. So this pictograph is actually uh, 38 feet high and 28 feet wide and it's a painting on a, on, on a cliff at the mouth of the river. And that just gives you kind of a close-up view of um, the act of painting that uh, onto the cliff and it it, it's a crest symbol that uh, shows the origin story of our people, which has to do with the wolf. So there's a wolf um, depicted within the, the, the face of the copper. The other interesting thing about it is that the coppers, that copper shape is actually uh, very closely associated with no internal notions of wealth amongst our people.
So I wanted to show this as well. <clears throat> this was a pole that was carved in uh, it was 1936. Um, it has the four crests of the four tribes of the of the Muskamak Daudeno, so a kind of a loose confederation of tribes that have come together and they have a shared history and, and kind of a, a relatively shared land base to a certain extent. So they're somewhat autonomous, but all linked together. So each one of the crests on this pole represents one of those nations. And so I wanted to show them because in a way, uh, they become national symbols. They are symbols of each individual nation that are deeply connected um, through their stories to the landscapes within which those people um, relate to. Uh, and this is a celebration that we had, you know, I think it was last summer. So, and I'm al I was also interested in the signage. So, uh, our community members painted these signs with our name and uh, had images on them. And there's this interesting crossover uh, that starts to happen between um, signs and symbols and in internal kind of traditional ways of understanding uh, what those signs and symbols mean and external ways of kind of looking at those signs and symbols and reading them in different ways. And I was, I'm really intrigued by all of this because I know that specifically a, a Northwest Coast work is highly consumed uh, out in BC, but often uh, the meaning or the, the, the meaning that's supposed to be kind of uh, put forward by those symbols is often very different from their original intention. So we'll go further back, we'll go way, way back, and this is about a hundred years ago. This is a, a photograph of Guayastum's village. And if you look at the painting here that's on the left, in the middle, you can't see it very well because it's kind of dark. But um, that was the painting that Emily Carr did when she came to uh, Guayastum's village within our territories. And that house is uh, Chief Johnny Scow's house, uh, my, my great-grandfather, Peter Scow's oldest brother. And Chief Johnny Scow, he was the head chief of the Kwikset Enoch people. And it was interesting that Emily Carr painted his house because, in a way, his house was a symbol of his authority, uh, his political authority, and also deeply connected then to uh, the lands and territories within which he held that political authority. If you look at this image, this is a illustration of the inside of the house. So the house posts that hold up the house are um, topped by what we call kolus. And those kolus for Johnny Skow represented Udzi Stalis, who was um, one of the original ancestors to come down in uh, Kwikset Enoch territory and establish a community. Um, so this directly links Johnny Scow's political authority to his um, to the land base within which he he uh, wields or has inherited that authority. And I wanted to show this because these are the chiefs of the 1914 McKenna McBride Land Commission. And in 1914, they put together a commission so that uh, in BC, so that they could um, resolve in question mark the land issue. So they sent a commission around to all the different tribes and they told the chiefs that they gathered there that they were going to ensure that their lands would be protected. And if they came and met with them and um, uh, told them which lands were there, then they would write it all down and they would go back to the Canadian government and then they would ensure that those lands would be protected for the First Nations people. So the chiefs all come, and they come in their regalia, which is symbolic of, of their authority within those lands. And uh, you can see they, they have beautiful, beautiful um, beaded blankets and, and headdresses, and this all represents the authority that they have in that deep connection to those lands. And they meet with the McKenna McBride Land Commission, and they tell them all the lands that they have jurisdiction over. The issue, though, however, was that while the chiefs were earnest in their approach to the McKenna McBride Land Commission, what really ended up happening was they would tell them all the lands that they felt that they held jurisdiction over. The McKenna McBride Commission would write it down, and then they would be denied. So they ended up with postage stamp-sized allocations of land. So the reserve that I come from, that I grew up on, Kingham Inlet, is three square miles. And we have seven reserves, and each of them is approximately uh, a square mile or or a half acre. Um, so when the chiefs were there, sitting at the, sitting at the table, thinking that these lands were going to be 
put aside for them and that they would be protected, the government was in fact authorizing the, the theft of those lands and basically the setup of these tiny reservations. So when I think about nations coming together to negotiate over land bases, I think often of the 1914 Land Commission, and I think it's a, kind of a, a shameful and embarrassing process that was put forward. And, and I, I feel strongly that our chiefs came there in all earnestness and brought with them all of their strong symbols and those histories within those lands, and, and that, that process was used to actually take those lands away from them. Um, but on the other hand, we have a resilient way of continuing to move forward with um, our, uh, our, our existence in this place. And one of the things that I thought was interesting was our people started to take up uh, signs. They started to use signs, um, appropriate that. And uh, So in this case, this is a photograph of a house in Alert Bay, and the chief who's had this house built juxtaposes his traditional image, which declares who he is and his ancestry and his place within the landscape and his authority, along with a, an English sign that gives his name, Tlaotlas, and this, his standing as an Imkish chief. I think it's a very interesting crossover that's starting to happen. Um, I, I wanted to show this in terms of the totem poles. So traditionally, this is one of the poles uh, in Alert Bay. And this is going to be a reverse appropriation because this tells of, of some of the history of the family that uh, lived in this house and, uh, and it's within its original context here. But we see here that it ends up in Stanley Park years later and it's been appropriated by general society as a tourist totem pole. And to this day is still there <laughs> and has a long lengthy history of probably millions and millions of international visitors coming to see it. So my question is, given the different contexts, how much does meaning shift? Um, so I'm going to talk and you know, start getting closer to talking about the works here in the gallery. And, uh, and this is um, a photograph of a village called Nawidi. And Nawidi is within Kwak, what used to be in Kwakwakiwak territory. It's Atlas Equala, or the Hope, Hope Island people. And this is very, very early on. This is taken around 1881. And uh, you see on the fronts of the houses, two of the chiefs have put these signs up. One of them, um, Boston, titled Boston, and the other one uh, titled Cheap. And we think that the name Cheap actually came from a strange um, kind of misinterpretation of the word chief. So this chief took on the name Cheap, but I think there's some interesting irony when it comes down to it. Um, the Boston refers to what we referred to Americans as. We called Americans Boston. Boston men and uh, Englishmen, King George men. So the word Boston is actually saying, you know, I've taken this name on Boston. Come and see me if you're an American trader. And I duplicated those signs uh, in a series of paintings that um, it, we'll end up kind of talking about this painting in a bit. But um, so you can see what the sign actually says, it says, Boston, he is the head chief of Nawidi. He is true and honest. He don't give no trouble to white man. Uh, I duplicated the text as it was. That's exactly how the sign was written. And basically, this chief, Boston, was inviting Americans to come and trade with him. Um, he was signifying that he was the authority within that land, and uh, he would be a good person to negotiate trade with. Um, the American Eagle symbol is interesting. That's what the... the the, the eagles on these paintings are taken from the American silver dollar. And I'm starting to look at uh, issues around um, capitalist enterprise. And the eagle, in many ways, actually represents new wealth amongst the Northwest Coast tribes. And uh, there was a creation of a new um, set of chiefs called eagle chiefs. And my hypothesis is that those eagle chiefs actually emerged out of a nouveau riche who, of chiefs who were negotiating with traders and uh, ships coming this way and they were getting wealthy fairly quickly and they were able to potlatch off their new wealth and they were able to kind of rise up as new chiefs, new powerful chiefs. And uh, in, in these signs to me were kind of invitations 
from these chiefs uh, to kind of bring that trade and to, to kind of negotiate a relationship with uh, Americans, kind of a trade relationship with Americans, which in many ways brought new wealth and a new cultural kind of flourishing along the coast, but after that brought smallpox epidemics and, and kind of a tremendous amount of mortality to the Northwest Coast. So it was a double, double-edged sword. Um, this one shows the painting Cheap, uh, and it says, he is one of the head chiefs of all tribes in this country. White men can get information. So in a way, these guys were kind of really promoting themselves to investors, traders coming, coming into their territories um, and looking to profit off of that. And I think these are kind of initial forays into kind of a capitalist model of um, um, power relationships. Um, and material wealth. 1792 is the date of first contact amongst our people. So then we kind of move on to this painting which is on the wall and uh, this the central painting uh, is a reconfiguration of the British Columbia um, provincial flag. Um, and it has its own title, which is um, Lament for the BC Tre Treaty Commission. Um, basically, in 1992, the, B the provincial government set up a commission uh, to resolve or to create treaties along the uh, northwest coast because in BC, the, mo the majority of the lands are non-treaty. Um, so there's all kinds of barriers to trade um, and industrialization. Um, and it's a big question mark for investment in those territories because of the question around the, the Indian lands. Um, it's been highly unsuccessful, mostly because it, um, it's, an, it's basically a pretty unbalanced negotiation. Um, as part of the Treaty Commission, you uh, are supposed to delineate your land base, and then as, as uh, the final negotiations, you pretty much get approximately one to three percent of what you say is your land base, and then you're compensated with money for the rest. So in technical terms, re realistically, it's more a purchase or the negotiation of the sale of your lands rather than a treaty negotiation of those lands. And this is why the BC Treaty process, the commission, has, has been in large part a failure on the coast. So I created this painting, which is basically um, the son, um, who in our language, I guess we would say, is very worse, which means he's very sad. Because um, while treaties are integral and absolutely needed on the coast, the current process in, in place is failing. And you can kind of see these ideas start to kind of meld together and mesh. I, I, after the, I had created the American, um, that, the, the American coin series, which is actually called My Heart Beats for Boston, which is a reflection of the circular form is a drum, and so it's kind of referring to, people talk about the drum as being the heartbeat of First Nations. And I'm, in a way, kind of making a little bit of fun at the chiefs who were kind of really putting themselves forward to kind of engage with um, kind of uh, these certain certain levels of um, trade and negotiation with uh, colonists and without realizing kind of the, the price that would be paid for the profits that initially would be gained by those uh, relationships. Um, so my heart beats for Boston is really this, this kind of tongue-in-cheek look at this notion of falling in love with uh, the introduction or the, the very beginnings of the love affair of, of, um, of uh, capitalism on the Northwest Coast. So the other two paintings, the ones that um, mirror um, the central painting, the, the Lament for the BC Treaty Commission, um, are sea otters, and sea otters were the, were the reason why the uh, trade ships initially came to the coast. Uh, they could, um, sea, sea otter furs were lucrative. You could 
buy a sea otter pelt on the coast, bring it over to China and sell it for a vast, vast profit. So that's why trade ships kept coming and coming. But what ended up happening was that the sea otter basically got hunted into extinction. And this was also one of our first forays into this kind of new capitalist relationship is that it was this massive exploitation of a resource for, for quick profits. And so 1911, the date on this painting, refers to the lowest population. So the sea otter hit its lowest population in 1911. It was almost extinct by then. So basically, actually, within a 30-year period, the sea otter trade was almost null and void because the, the hunt for them was just so extensive. And this was also with our participation because we were the ones hunting the sea otters and then trading them for, for the money. And so, uh, but 1929 is also the date that First Nations in BC reached their lowest population count as well, because we were in massive decline as well, and we were almost wiped out through through smallpox and other other diseases. And 1929 is our lowest date of um, um, population, but it is also the date that our population began to climb, which is very interesting because now today we have the fastest growing population in Canada. Um, here we have the painting kind of, uh, but you don't need to see that because it's, it's on the wall anyways. So, um, but I wanted to show, I ended up doing these sea otter paintings and I was looking at that relationship to China and I was using it as a parallel to, like look, basically looking at historical relationships and, and mapping them to contemporary relationships. And right now, uh, there's a relationship with China that's pretty tenuous as far as First Nations land issues go. And uh, so I th I'm trying to put forward a caution, um, you know, to look at the example of what happened with the sea otter trade and consider that before rushing into uh, major decisions around resource extraction. So... Uh, the way that these works were shown initially was this work was shown on one wall and then the American um, My Heart Beats for Boston were shown on the other. And, and I'm really questioning the relationship of First Nations to kind of a capitalist ideology. I, I feel quite strongly that um, there are uh, principles that just don't match up with one another. And the difficulty with the BC Treaty Commission, current BC Treaty Commission, is that they really just are looking for First Nations to become kind of like municipalities and uh, operate along the same economic lines as, as the rest of Canada. And yet our attachment to our land base and our uh, thoughts around um, long-term, what's going to happen long-term, don't map very well to kind of uh, the way that modern capitalism is exercised. So it's not a good model for us to be uh, embracing with kind of arms wide open. I think we need to have a hands-off, arm's length, uh, critical look at what that relationship has been for us and how do we, how do we uh, negotiate a future for ourselves that um, maintains uh, our own integral sense of uh, how we relate to the land we occupy and the resources within that land. Um, that's just another close-up. If you look at, this gives you a sense of how I reconfigured the British Columbia flag. And so what I'm doing with these works, and if it kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning when I was showing the totem poles, in, and in many ways there's been a, an appropriation and a reappropriation of symbols and signs between First Nations and uh, uh, non-First Nations. In many ways, our symbols and signs have been incorporated into a tourism uh, industry. Uh, in, in, it's, it's very interesting to see how Emily Carr uh, uh, kind of incorporated um, our signs and images into her own imagery, and then that how, be, how that has become uh, na uh, nationally iconic <laughs> and somewhat problematic, and, uh, but at the same time dynamic. Um, so I wanted to do these reverse kind of appropriations. Um, so, uh, flags in particular, uh, coinage, they all re refer to um, power histories and dominating narratives. Um, interesting thing about the British Columbia flag is that the sun represents this slogan uh, amongst the British that the sun never set on Britain because Britain had colonized so much of the plan planet. <laughs> 
that basically, you know, within each country or within each segment of the globe, uh, somewhere the sun was shining. <laughs> so I changed that and I made it into a kwakwakiwak sun, but the sun, um, instead of being happy about that, is actually quite despondent. Um, I wanted to do, like, in some ways I want to say that what I'm trying to do with my paintings and um, isn't necessarily uh, a new thing. So this is a photograph of um, Chief at Tzachis, or um, uh, Fort Rupert, within our territories. And he has incorporated the symbols of the kind of authority of the colonists in terms of the cane. This cane was given to him uh, as a gift. And one of the things that uh, our people really very early on wanted as a trade item were the jackets, the jackets with the uh, buttons. And uh, those were seen to be um, like, uh, I guess, uh, regalia, almost a, in a sense regalia, or uh, a way of showing authority and power. So I've also um, kind of incorporated those, like uh, particularly the buttons, uh, into um, contemporary paintings. Um, I, I, in this particular installation, I don't know if these paintings will stay together, but I had really wanted to reflect on the Canadian flag. So the red panels basically represent the kind of outside um, components of the of the Canadian national flag. Uh, I I have a love affair off off and on with Canada. I I appreciate Canada for certain things. I struggle with can the notion of what Canada is as a nation and my re relationship to it. At, on the other hand, and so it tends to pop up quite often. Um, kind of me this attempt to rework or understand what that relationship really is. Um, this is the Chinese national flag, and you can see the incorporation of the Chinese national flag into these paintings as well. Um, this was this takes us finally <laughs> back to the very very beginning image, which is of the billboard, which is situated uh, here in Saskatoon over the summer. And I wanted to question. Um, our engagement with the current um, FIPA deal, Canada-China FIPA deal, which was ratified yesterday, actually. And from my understanding of what's happening, um, there's a new, kind of relatively new concept that's emerging, and that's called uh, economic colonialism. Basically, there was a physical colonization that happened um, when people came to the coast and then um, physically started to kind of uh, take over lands and territories and then make laws around that and make it official. Um, but currently right, what's happening right now is what I consider to be an economic form of colonization. And I, would, I think that the majority of, uh, unfortunately the majority of Canadians are kind of lulled into not quite understanding what's happening on these kind of upper, upper level economic negotiations where we're giving up tremendous amounts of rights over resources. Um, and this is where First Nations come in because it's First Nations who are somewhat blocking these deals from, from uh, proceeding uh, without kind of uh, any form of opposition. There's one small First Nations band on the coast who has in court, um, um, are, they're, they're fighting the Canada-China FIPA deal because they do recognize that in many ways, economically, this is a form of colonization. Uh, only it's economic, but ultimately it's tied into lands and resources. Um, and that we are losing in some ways, uh, and this is, this is Canadians in general, jurisdiction over our own nation when we enter into economic trade deals that uh, give up uh, too much on the side of, uh, um, I guess, Canada and its relationship to China. And I'm just saying these things because we've gone through this. First Nations have gone through this. We, we've gone through that history. We're still kind of fighting and putting ourselves forward to try and figure out uh, how to negotiate that history, how to make things right, how to move forward. Uh, at the same time, we're still uh, very firmly attached to, to our land bases. Um, and these land issues uh, still remain to be, be resolved. But my 
concern, I guess, is that this goes beyond um, uh, concerns around First Nations. It's, it's no longer an internal national um, issue between First Nations and the government of Canada, it, that there are international issues, economic issues that, that Canadians in general need to be looking at because in many ways they map very similarly to what's happened to First Nations. Uh, so <laughs> I do, I did put that raven in there and he's kind of looking back uh, in a way and he's saying, whose land is this anyways? And, and it's a pretty open-ended question. It's about laws and regulations and how we define boundaries and how we identify ourselves and, and how we um, uh, uh, uphold certain laws and privileges. And there's a big question mark there. And uh, I think because even for me, having looked at all of this, there's, there remains a very large question mark in my mind as well. Thank you.